So especially for those that are going home that are done, this is going to be valuable for you to uh, kind of solidify your skills, everything you've learned in the past. How long is the program? Three months. Three months. Okay. Yeah. So everything you've learned in the last three months. Okay. So this, that's kind of hard to see. Huh? This is a, a painting of my father, uh, Matt Guinness. He is a, he's a potter and a, and a sculptor. And when it, Whenever I was a kid, I'd go to his shop, to his studio on campus, and just kind of hang out and play with sticks and stuff. And all these college kids would come up to my dad and ask him career advice. He was known as like being the wise career guy on campus. They'd come up to him and say, you know, what should I do? What should I go into? And he'd always give them the advice. Um, do for a living what you got in trouble for as a kid. And for him, that was that was literally playing in the mud. He grew up on a on a almond farm in California, and his mom would always get get him in trouble for playing in the mud. So now he's he plays in the mud as a profession. So that's the advice he gave. Um, maybe he shouldn't have given that advice because for me, he got me in trouble as a kid for playing games instead of studying. So I took his advice literally, <laughs> and. I, I play and I build games as a living. Um, you, you mentioned Flexbox Zombies. I don't know if you can really see. But uh, so I, I was at a job. I'd been a web developer for uh, about 12 years. I was making about 180 grand at my job. And I decided to quit because uh, I realized there's more than just two tracks in once you're a developer. You know, people always talk about the, the tech track, right? The technical track or management track. Well, there's a third track, it's the entrepreneur track. And that's what I went with. So I quit my job, put in my notice, and told my wife I was building a video game to teach people <laughs> flex box. And she's like, okay, I trust you, you know? So six months later, I shipped it, and I was pretty proud of it. And she's like, okay, when does the, when does the paycheck start again? And I was like, well, I'm gonna give this one away for free. <laughs> and she's like, okay, I, I trust you. So uh, I gave this one out for free and um, to share some business side of this, the goal of this one was to, you know, get my name out there and get people on my list, you know, and then the idea being I would build future things for them and, and charge for those things. So, so far about 17,000 people have played Flexbox Zombies and it's been just a huge hit and it's grown my list and then every, about every week, I try to do every week, sometimes I slack but um, I try to email my list about every week, which is giving them valuable stuff, you know, giving them tips. And then uh, about last November, I launched my next game, Grid Critters, which is uh, you know, this Captain Meg and you land on a planet and you gotta use CSS Grid to position the planet back in place and save these little critters. So it's done really well. It's enough, I make it enough with the entrepreneur life to keep going. For a while so um it's been, it's been awesome but the point is like once you're a developer and you guys are you guys are developers now in my mind you have so many options there's so many routes you can go with it it's it's seriously the best skill set you possibly could have invested in and it also enables you to do some really cool things like b school does a lot of good in the world um you can do a lot of good with your skill set you know i just wrote a blog post called start a gratitude project and the basic idea is to you know, developers always talk about having a side project. Well, the gratitude project is like a side project, except it's just completely for somebody else. No intent to get anything out of it. And you can do that with your dev skills. You know, one of my friends just built a website that helps parents know how to protect their kids from pornography. You know, he uses tech skills to do that. Um, I know a couple of people who, have, who are developers who got sick and have been struggling to kind of get back on their feet. I was able to just send them a coupon, give them this thing for free, you know, just to help them out. And they're so grateful. And it's just awesome that you, you can help people with this skill. So you made the right choice. All right, I'll tell you a story. So not too long ago, I was really excited about getting this truck. <laughs> you know, the, kind of the burnt orange, the, the tires, just the whole, the whole deal. I was really pumped about it. My wife, she's a very supportive wife. She was, she was excited too. Somewhere though, along, along the lines, she, uh, you know, while I was shopping for cars, for trucks, she convinced me that what I really wanted was 
this used blue minivan. <laughs> so that's what we ended up getting. And it's such a smart move, right? Like, it only takes maybe half a Saturday to fold down all the seats so I can carry in some stuff. About half of what a truck could have carried. Um, could carry, it gets to fit all of my kids, all four kids, and they're just a joy to ride with, you know, especially the baby who screams. <laughs> anyway, so it was a good purchase. Um, the kids love it, take great care of it. That's, that's my daughter, Emmy. They, uh, they're very enthusiastic about how they open and close that sliding door. Um, no joke, this last two days ago, I took, the, I took this van in to get fixed at the shop. And we parked, you know, we pulled up, we parked in front of the, the mechanic shop and the owner was driving this Bobcat tractor and doing some work, you know. He didn't see us and he backed right into us and did that. So this, this is just like the unlucky vehicle. Um, but he was nice enough to agree to split half the cost to fix this. So clever upsell strategy. Anyway, um, anybody seen, what is this show called? American Housewife? Great show. They drive the same minivan and it's hilarious. They have a, they have a giant dent on the side in the exact spot that we do. Um, anyway, the point of this story is as soon as I bought this car, I drove it home and all of a sudden I'm seeing these blue minivans just everywhere. Like I wasn't unique at all. Utah's got so many of these blue on the minivans. And there's a name for that. It's called the Bader Mainhoff phenomenon. Named after, so this journalist in the 80s um, kept seeing this, this terrorist group in Germany pop up everywhere. He kept seeing them. So he named, he dubbed this the Bader Mainhoff phenomenon after this Bader Mainhoff group. Um, and the idea is like once you're aware of something, your brain is kind of looking for it, right? And so then you start seeing it everywhere. It's like, oh my gosh everybody's moving to react or you know everybody's doing this but it's, it's not maybe not necessarily the case it's just that your brain's scanning for it so what if we could use that mechanism in our brain what if we could control it and have it be looking for and scanning for the things that we care about not necessarily blue crappy minivans but um looking for things that we want to get good at there's a psychiatrist robert uh, stick gold at Harvard Medical School and he is my hero this guy has done a ton of studies and he does my kind of study he has people play Tetris for hours a day so he help, he help him play with Tetris for a couple hours in the morning a couple hours at night and then he'll then they'll have, he'll have them go home and sleep and come back the next day and report about their sleep and what he found was that people after playing Tetris so much they go home and sleep and dream and they have these dreams about these big geometric shapes falling from the sky. And they're trying to like arrange them and put them in, you know, how they fit. And then they'd leave the game, they'd leave the study and they'd go home and they'd see cars parked, they'd see buildings. And in their mind, they're like, ooh, this car could fit here. You know, like the Tetris, Tetris had just completely dominated their mindset. And they're starting to see these, these shapes everywhere. So he called that the, the Tetris effect. Now, if you can see it, I'll let you watch that hit. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'll let you watch it. Oh, just kidding. Here it goes. Isn't that like the most satisfying thing ever? Uh, it's like there's a lot of bad in the world, but when you see something like that, it's like everything's going to be okay. Okay, so he says, the type respect, the thing that they're paying so much attention to begins to pattern their thoughts, their mental images, and their dreams. This is actually a really good thing because he, so he did this study, right, with regular people, but then he's like, I wonder what happens if we do the same study, this Tetra study, with people who can't form long-term memory. And ironically, I just forgot what that's called. <laughs> It's not Alzheimer's. What is the word for it? Amnesia. There it is. <laughs> oh, that is ironic. So people with amnesia that couldn't form long-term memory, he had to do this study. And every morning, they'd come into the study, 
and they had completely forgotten that they they were there yesterday, you know, that they were there the day before. So he had to teach them how to play Tetris all over again, right? Um, but what he found is those same people who couldn't form long-term memory, they were having the grit, they were having the Tetris dreams. So they came and reported seeing these geometric shapes, and they had no idea why. They didn't know they were playing Tetris for four hours the day before. Um, and another interesting thing is they come and sit down for the study, and their hands would go place, get placed, they'd place their own hands at the computer in the exact position that they needed to, to play Tetris. So what he found is that these people, though their long-term memory was busted, their procedural memory was still intact. And they could still form procedural memory. Does that mean something? Hey there. Um, so procedural memory is what you use when you drive a car, right? It's you're driving down the, down the highway, you're looking at the pretty Utah mountains, your arm is doing like little adjustments, you know, to keep you from going off the side. And you're not thinking, how do I drive a car? How do I drive a car? I'm going to mess it up. You know, you're just driving, you're listening to a podcast or whatever. That's procedural memory. Procedural memory, some people, sometimes we call it muscle memory, but basically it allows us to do things without thinking about it and allows us to think about something else. And that procedural memory is where we want to get our tech skills into. The worst spot for your tech skills is short-term memory, right? You learn something, you're, you're like, okay, I got this. You go and maybe you build something with it, and then the next day you forget it. It's gone. Um, Long-term memory is a little better, right? You go to build something like, oh, yeah, I learned this in V-School. Oh, yeah, uh, I think Bob said it was this. And you, you remember it, right? And you're able to build it. And that's, that's better than short-term memory. But ideally, you sit down to build something, and you're not thinking about the tech at all. You're thinking about what you're building. You're thinking about solving a problem for somebody, a real person. When you, when you think of with CSS, I want people to be able to sit down and think of a layout and just crank it out you know, in seconds and be done, not having to go to CSS tricks and look up what is justify content again, uh, what is, what is uh, align items, you know what I mean? You want to be able to just sit down and, and build anything you want. And that applies not to just CSS, but to JavaScript, to whatever framework you're using. So that procedural memory is where we want to get our tech skills. Um, so this psychiatrist gave us the formula. And basically, he said it's regular sleep and regular practice. And he found that people who got better sleep at night, they had stronger Tetris dreams, and they had this, a stronger Tetris effect. So their procedural memory was impacted a whole lot more because of their sleep. So that's something I don't think we talk enough about in the tech world. You know, we hear all these like cool stories about people in San Francisco working 20 hours a day somehow, you know, living out of their van and never seeing their mattress or their family, and they become these heroes, right? But this, that's not a great way to start. That's not a great way to learn. Um, so I'd encourage you to get cycles as you need. There's a good book called Sleep Smarter that basically says don't don't try to get like eight hours of sleep. Try to get seven and a half because seven and a half is five um, cycles of 90 minutes, right? So either shoot for seven and a half or nine hours. And I like, I, I feel amazing when I get nine hours of sleep. And not only do I feel good, but I remember things that the day before that I learned in practice. Okay, and so I've done so much CSS, Flex, Box, and Grid lately that I've experienced this Tetris effect with both of these. So I can't help it when I'm playing a game. Anybody played Zelda? Great game, right? I can't help but see a CSS grid when I look at this, right? So super hard to see the lines, but um, these items that Link has are formed in a perfect grid. So I've actually built this with CSS, and you can watch me build it on my site, um, ged.ski slash build slash Zelda. So you can follow along and build that with me if you want. I'm also a fan of Overwatch. Any Overwatch players in here? So Overwatch, this hero picker screen. There you go, you can see those a little better. I see this and all I see is a grid. I couldn't help but build this as well. Yeah, there we go. Had to include the grid gaps and everything. So you can watch me build that. It's on my site. It's ged.ski. Um, let's see, one more game. 
Destiny 2, anybody playing that? Okay, so this, this screen is where you, you kind of build out your talents and your tech tree. And that's just a grid that's rotating 45 degrees. And with CSS, you can do that too. You can build a grid, do a transform to rotate it, and build really interesting UIs using something, using grid, which is cool because sometimes you see a layout and it won't look like a grid, but it actually will be a grid, which is neat. Then you'll start to get just completely broken. You'll start, you'll start seeing grids everywhere. On the, on the wall, these pictures, it's like, oh yeah, two columns, two rows, a little gap between them. Um, that's when you know you need to take a break and maybe go draw or talk to a real human or something. But, yeah, go watch a show, do something else. But it's actually cool when this starts to happen to you. My wife's makeup box. I was like, hey. I was like, can I borrow that? She's like, sure. And by the way, as developers, this, this effect, this Tetris effect, is why it becomes harder and harder to relate to normal humans. <laughs> Right, like your, your brain is literally changing and so it becomes harder and harder to have a conversation with people who don't know how to code or muggles as I like to call them. <laughs> but so there, there's the code pen screenshot built in grid, got it pretty close. I was invited to speak at the Grand America Hotel recently. I don't know if you can really see that, but the, I was looking out at the audience and realized that the layout of that room was a grid as well. So I asked for the asked for the layout from the, the people in charge and coded it up as a grid just to show them that they were sitting in a grid. <laughs> so basically, the point I want to make is the Tetris effect of that procedural memory, that's our goal for any tech you learn. So it's not enough just to learn something once and forget about it. You need regular practice and you need to get a lot of sleep. So you guys are going home, they're done, keep it up. Like it, go through things, maybe go through your notes. I don't know if they give you homework or anything, but look through what you've, you've done and practice it regularly, get awesome sleep, and then that's not, your whole B-School experience is just gonna stick. So I've done, I've put together all the practice for Flexbox Zombies and CSS and Grid Critters, but I think these principles apply um, to every tech. So that's what I would encourage you to do. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. Um, I also mentioned I mentioned my gratitude project. I brought you guys each some stickers um, that you can put on your laptop. They look like this, basically. So yeah, I'll put them out. And you guys can normally have my kids assemble them, but they're. Uh, they're getting too smart and now they're starting to charge me. I can't afford my own kids' child labor. So I'll let you just grab one of each and put them in your own bags. Do right, so we have any questions? Yeah. So, you know, you, you talk about like a game like Tetris or even Flexbox Zombies. One of the challenges that I find is being so new to programming, the, the wealth of information I can go into mm. to then kind of create what? Yeah, that is that is such a good question. Do the people online could they hear that question? So her question was basically there's so much out there to learn. What should what should I spend my time learning? I wrote a blog post about this exact topic. Where was it? There it is. Deciding what oh not that one. Deciding what not to learn. I'd recommend you go read this, but basically, there's so much out there, like she said, that it's just like, oh my gosh, you could spend your whole life learning bits and pieces of everything and not get good at anything. So what I like to do is only, I, I'm very selective about the things that I learn, and I only learn the things that solve problems that I currently have. That's basically what this article's about. So even though at the time I wrote this, yarn was this new hot thing, right? I had no problems that yarn solved, so I stuck with NPM, and I just kind of put it on the shelf. So I like, I like to make this kind of mind map of all the tech that is, is telling me I need to learn it, and then I go through it and I mark things that I actually want to learn or I don't want to learn, and then I just shelf everything else. A lot of these things, like 
a lot of these things become R&D for the tech that you're using. For example, um, so I use React for my projects. Uh, Preact became this hot thing, right? And a lot of people like Preact and are using it. Um, but I look at it's what it solves, and I had none of those problems, and so I stuck with React. And a lot of a lot of the Preact learnings become R&D. You know, they make it back into React. So also, I just wouldn't guilt trip yourself. You don't have to know everything. Um, you can focus entirely on specific area. You can focus completely on being a front end dev. You don't have to know back end or databases. If you're interested in it, then go for it. But I wouldn't ever learn something out of like a, a feeling of, gosh, I have to catch up or, oh, I'm dumb or I'm not as smart as this guy, you know? Only learn stuff you're interested in that solves your current problems so you can build lots of stuff with people. Great question. Any others? So, um, when you were starting out before, and what was the way that you were learning? Like, were you building projects for yourself? Were you trying to find other people to help? Yeah, so I, for me, it's always been project based. So, I had no idea how to build a website yeah. like, at all. And um, I was in college as a, what, what was I? Business major. No, I switched so many times, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I started out like international business. That sounds cool. And I got in class and I hated all the business people. They were all a bunch of jerks. So I dropped out of that and went to switch to horticulture of all things. Um, I was like landscape architecture. That sounds neat. I was the only dude in the class, you know, like arranging flowers. I was like, yeah, maybe this isn't for me. Then uh, I was like, dentists make money. I'm going to be a dentist. <laughs> so then I took Chem 105. And the, that class just killed me. To get a B, I just, it just destroyed me. I was like, I'm not doing any more chemistry. Then I remembered how much fun I had in my IS 140 class where we were using Excel and building like little macros. And I made this practice program for myself, um, for my jazz piano practicing. And I love, everybody else in the class hated that class and I loved it. So I was like, okay, maybe I am a nerd. And then I switched to it full time and never looked back. But, um, yeah, so right after I switched, to it, I was like, I'm awesome. I could do anything. And this guy hit me up and he's like, hey, my, my aunt needs a website. You know how to build websites, right? And I was like, yeah. I'd done like nothing. <laughs> you know, I didn't know how to build websites. But like, sure, what does she need? So I drove out to Brigham City, Utah and met with her. And uh, she runs this program for kids called Tavasi School. Um, it's like a music program. So she's giving me all these requirements. And I'm just sitting there talking to her, like nodding my head and just thinking, I am in way over my head on this. But, you know, I didn't let her know that. She's like, how much is this going to cost? I was like, well, oh, probably about 7000 This was like 12 years ago, you know. So that's a lot of money. She didn't even blink. She's like, okay. And I was like, holy. <laughs> so I go home and then I'm like Googling how to build website. <laughs> you know? I seriously had nothing that I was doing. But I... Uh, I figured it out right? because I had a project. I had a person I wanted to serve who was paying me. Um, and I learned at the time Drupal was, no, Joomla, CMS Joomla was the cool thing. So I learned that a little bit. I learned a little bit of PHP, just enough to do what I needed for that site. And I built her a great site and she, she likes it. I think it's still up. Please do not judge me for this. <laughs> Tavasi School. Oh, this is gonna be embarrassing. May have spelled it wrong. Oh shoot, this is it. I don't know if I want to show it. We'll see if they've redesigned. Oh, okay, good. They've redesigned it since. Archive.org. <laughs> oh, we don't even know about archive.org right now. <laughs> anyway, the point is, like for me, I, I have a really hard time learning something just for the sake of learning it. I just, I don't know, my brother is not that way. He can just learn. He learns all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, what are you going to use that for? He's like, what do you mean? He's like, I just want to know it. I was like, my brain doesn't work, work that way. I have to have a, something I'm trying to build. And usually for me, it's side projects. That's where I learn most of my stuff is through a side project. Because at work, you get to work and they want you to use, you know, one stack. And you'll learn it and you'll build something. You'll, but then you're going to get interested in, this, you know, some other thing. So 
I, I found it really valuable to always have a side project and I learn the tech that I'm interested in that will help me build that side project. Yeah, project based has always been my thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Just pick things that apply to your the thing you're trying to build, learn that, use it, and then celebrate. <laughs> yeah. Kind of on that now, how do you like I have a project, I know I want to do this. What's what's your process for finding the right tool or the technology that you need to use that? You know what's funny, like the right tool, there really isn't um, sometimes there's, but most of the time it's, there's not a right and a wrong tool. You'll hear very strong opinions out there of why, why Angular is the best thing, or why React's the best thing, or why Vue is the right choice, right? But really, we are emotional creatures. We pick things because they make us feel powerful, or they make us feel awesome. So we pick them because we, they make us feel good, and then we, we can't just say that's why we picked it, right? You look like an idiot. So then you have to come up with all these technical reasons oh it's 75 percent faster than x or y right that's all bs like people people pick things because they they're into it um so if someone else is into something and you're not then don't don't pick it you know pick the things that just feel right to you i think you'll develop an intuition over time of what what tools fit the way that you think like for a lot of people fp is just functional programming just conflicts with how they think you know, so they're trying to code something in, in FP and their mind is just, it's just not working for them. And despite months of trying, I know a guy who's, who's a genius, but FP does not work with his brain. And so he's, he's dropped it because, because it's, just, it's not a good fit for him personally. So yeah, I, I think tech is a lot of that way. The people who write tech, they're either going to, you know, they're going to build it. They're going to build tools that fit the way they think. So if you think this similar to, similarly to them, then it's going to be a great fit for you. So how do you, I guess, how, like, how do you know I have this problem? Do I just Google that problem and then see what comes up? Or what's your process for finding that? Yeah, so usually, usually when you're building an app, you've got, you've got scenarios and you've got problems. So a scenario would be, um, usually there's like 10 scenarios that really come down to a single problem. So what the first step is to boil down your scenario into like, what's the underlying problem I'm trying to solve here? And it's not, maybe it's not I'm trying to build a drag and drop UI. Maybe it's not, um, I'm trying to build a form, but maybe there's something a lot more, you know, a problem that once solved, it solves all 10 of the scenarios. So look for that root, that root problem, and then Google how people are solving that problem rather than the scenario. And then you're going to find, I don't know, between three and ten different ways to solve it. I'm going through this process right now. For I'm looking for um, a database that is going to be perfect for this next Flipkart app that I'm building. Um, so I was looking at Firebase. I've, I've been looking at Realm.io and a bunch of others. But basically, I got down to the problem I want to solve, which is connecting to the database directly from the client, you know, from the browser, not running, not having to worry about a server in the middle and having it be fast and real time and sync. So I kind of narrowed it down and now I'm just trying out options that fit. And I tried one called Fauna database and I knew instantly that it wasn't for me because I tried to get a basic select query working and it just, it wasn't working and the docs just made absolutely no sense to me. I hit up the, the founder and he's trying to help me and he's sending me examples um, and even those don't work so I was like yeah I'm out so you just gotta at some point you, you gotta try it and then don't give yourself too hard of a criteria of has to be the right answer because there isn't one just one that's the best fit for you and your team yeah have you come up with your idea for uh, your oh boy so I was at my job, I was working on a form and I hate writing forms, I just, I just absolutely hate them. I was working on this form and just like staring with dead eyes at the computer screen, you know, and I was like, I gotta get a different job. <laughs> I was making good money, but I was, I was bored out of my mind. So uh, I, went, I went home and, or actually I went to McDonald's because I love the double cheeseburgers and Diet Coke. So I went there and I was, 
I was working on my resume, you know, and it was a pages document. And I couldn't get the dang things to line up how I wanted. I was so frustrated. I was like, ah, oh, I'm just going to do this in CSS, which um, was a bad idea. But it turned out to be long-term beneficial because I was building the thing in Flexbox, and I kept having to look up Flexbox, you know. I kept having to go to the CSS tricks, and it was taking me forever. And I was like, I've built tons. I've built maybe seven projects, six or seven projects already in Flexbox. I should know this stuff. Right, so that's when I realized that like, a lot of times we, we hamstring ourselves by not actually learning the tech, not getting into that procedural memory. So then I just started diving into Flexbox. I read the spec and I was like, I should not have become technical. So I don't understand anything this document says. It was just whew. So then I just started playing. I just started playing with Flexbox. I go to CodePen and make an example and just like, play with just by content and, um, you know, the different flex directions. I slowly started to figure it out after just playing with it. And then I used what I learned to build that, that form at work. And then it made a lot more sense. And that's when I, like, I realized, oh, and in that process, I came up with like mental models for myself to how to remember like, okay, flex direction, that's kind of like shooting a crossbow, you know, and I can shoot it up, I can shoot it down, I can shoot it left. So I kind of came up with this mental model. And at work, um, Work had just dropped IE, um, IE9 support, so we were able to use Flexbox. And so I started cranking out a bunch of stuff in Flexbox. Everybody else was struggling with it, so I became the guy, the Flexbox guy, right? So they all came and asked me, how do I do Flexbox? And I'd teach them my little mental model. I was drawing out zombies, you know, and I was drawing crossbows, and it was like, think about it like this. And it was like working for people. And they encouraged me, like, you should, you should publish this somewhere, because this is awesome. So I. I did, I made a little uh, email campaign that was like nine emails explaining Flexbox, you know, and you just get the, it was just all static, it was all pretty boring with some code pen challenges. And overnight, like 350 people signed up for that. Uh, my mind was just blown because like, you know, I had a blog and maybe four subscribers before that point. You know, sign up for my newsletter, no one cares. <laughs> But all of a sudden, people were signing up for this Flexbox email thing. So I was like, dang, this is sweet. So that excitement combined with I hate my job, I put in my two weeks like that Friday. I was like, I'm out. Um, so I was like, I'm going to go and build this thing for real. So I took that prototype and turned it into the full game that a lot of you have played. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just kind of, it feels like an accident looking back, like how I kind of stumbled into it. But yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the tech that Flexbox obviously built on? I mean, yeah. Teachable, but... Yeah, I use Teachable to, just for the, the payment and like the subscriber, the, like the sign up process and for their like progression, like as a user completes a level, it keeps track, you know? Really, I want to get away from Teachable eventually because it was not meant for what I'm building. <laughs> but in fact, I had the, the CTO of Teachable message me on Twitter and he's like, holy crap, what have you done? <laughs> He's like, our engineering team is playing Flexbox Zombies right now, and they don't know how you did this on our platform. <laughs> I really had to hack Teachable quite a bit. Um, but yeah, so the, the tech stack itself, it's, it's React. Um, I'm using Greensock for animations. Um, this, is nice, this app's nice because there is no backend, right? So there's no, there's no node server or anything. Um, no database to store anything. Yeah, Teachable, they keep track of the, yeah, so they have some a database. Eventually, uh, that's why one of the reasons why I'm looking into databases right now. Eventually, I'll move away from Teachable and just have my, control my own platform, you know. Um, let's see. Flexbox Zombies was built mostly with Flexbox, obviously. <laughs> and Grid Creators was mostly with CSS Grid. Um, and then just JavaScript. I'm using, I started with create React app so that I could you know, have React quick and also have ES6 because I really like um, template literals. But yeah, it's a pretty simple stack, but it, it does its trick. What yeah. is Greensock? I guess I Greensock, it's an animation library for the web. GSAP is the other name for it. Um, basically, it just lets, it, it lets you do like declarative animations or procedural animations. Um, and they're really smooth. They work on mobile. 
it's a good library. Um, the web is getting a web animations API soon, I think is going to replace that maybe in a couple of years, but for now it's the best thing I've found for animations. Oh, and then I use, um, I use Spine. So Spine, Spine is a tool for basically character animation. So anyone who's played the game, like as soon as you shoot a zombie, it gets hit with the arrow, right? And then it, it goes poof and it turns into a skeleton that then like falls over and collapses and there's bones rattling, you know? So that would be really hard to do with CSS transforms or um, JavaScript animations. So I take those assets. In fact, I wrote a blog post about that too. Let's see if I have it. Character animation, yeah. So let's see. Yeah, so here's the animation I'm talking about. Oh, it's, you can't really see it. So I start with these drawings, right? Then I go through a bunch of iterations and kind of get, get the asset how I like it. Once it's ready, here's Meg. Once the assets are ready, I, I export them from Photoshop to a tool called Spine that basically breaks them up into these layer sprites. And inside of Spine, I can, I can hook up um, images to bones. So it's like, okay, the, the leg of the landing gear is hooked up to this, this bone that I created. And then you can do really cool animations like that using a timeline, kind of like flat, kind of like you could with Flash back in the day. So anyways, I do that with Spine and then I export that. And Spine gives me this JavaScript API. So I can control the, I can control the animations in my app. That's a little more advanced. The Spine tool is not free. It's like 300 bucks, I think. But unless you're doing character animation, you don't need it. Good question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I have never told anyone about it except my dog, but I'll tell you about it. Yeah, so right now, the problem with my, my business is that it takes me between six to eight months to build one of these games, you know, because there's a story, there's tons of animation, there's character development, um, there's all the exercises I got to build. Um, the engine that checks everything, they just, they take forever to build. So at this rate, you know, by the time I die, I might only have covered, I don't know, like 40, 40 more topics, but I want to cover a lot more than that. So I'm trying to kind of boil down my games to like, just the, just the practicing part. Like what, what would it look like if I cut out the story, if I cut out all the characters and had just, just the thing that people can practice. Um, I'll, I'll continue to build games for like the big, the big things that I'm interested in, but for everything else, I want to build like a flashcard, kind of like um, Anki. Has anyone used Anki, a spaced repetition software? Yeah, I want to build something like that, only for, for code. So um, like, let's say you learn something about, about animation and you don't want to forget it. Um, my app would have like an animation deck of cards that you could go and like go through every once in a while just to refresh your memory and not forget the stuff that you learned. So that's the idea. Uh, let me know when you finish that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're using right now, but you um, yeah, none of them do very well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm prototyping that already. I think it's going to be cool. The other cool thing about that, as far as a business standpoint goes, is that that makes my business like a compliment to all the instructors out there rather than a, a competitor, right? So my friend Kent, Kent C. Dodds, let's say he creates a, a new course on React. He's gonna have some gems from that course, some key things that people should learn. He could come to my platform, create that deck of cards and then sell it for, I don't know, 10 bucks or something. So then he's making, he's making money off these cards as well as his course. And then I don't have to write all the content so I could have a huge collection of decks of cards eventually. If anyone copies my idea, I'm coming after you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Did you have a question back there? No? 
Okay, well, let me, let me give you the stickers. I'll just kind of lay them out somewhere. You can come get one of each. That's why I 
See my bag
So this guy is whatever that is, that's the payload. It's okay. That's what's getting decoded. So it's the user data. Right? And so uh, and that happens in science.
Just one again. Just one again. Just one again. Just one again. Just Oh, you're not mapping through. So, 
Um, now, you can also have the same issue with your, your, your this is asynchronous. And so this will only run. Okay. Does this need to be uncommon for this to be asynchronous? This will only run after the set state completes. Mm -hmm. And here you did set state. Or is this? Actually, this might still be playing. It was, it was it was working. It was always clicking the code, and then it just kind of got lost because I had something in the middle. So we added it like somewhere in the editing, and then it was slowly working like it was showing set mostly. And this was because we were switching the master. And uh, anyway, is there a reason this is inside of this thread? Or sorry, no, this we're just trying. To, we're just trying to find. Yeah, right here, it's only going to run if there's a set. Okay, but we don't have that. Because this will run. Oh, because you didn't set it. We just we need to know when there's a thing. And then we're going to check. And that's it.
So you sort of probably get this
So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm passing it as props.
this week.